Welcome to Lecture 5 on Congress. Before turning to the question of how a bill becomes law, it's important to note that the congressional leadership and committee system could not function without the help of their congressional staff. Once again, the structure of the Constitution's bicameral system matters greatly to congressional action. The Senate as a whole has 4,000 personal staffers, for example, but averages about 40 per state, while the House has 7,000, but averages just 16 per district. Congressional staffers are responsible for everything from writing tweets for individual members to drafting legislation for committees and subcommittees. However, staffs tend to be divided into those who work in Washington and those who work in state or district offices back home. Personal staffers in Washington and the districts are almost entirely dedicated to constituent service, often in the form of casework for citizen problems, while committee and party staffers in Washington handle the larger legislative agenda. The number of House and Senate personal staffers has remained mostly unchanged over the past two decades, but the percentage of those staffers assigned to the home offices has increased rapidly as members work to build upon their incumbency advantages. Now, there are other kinds of uh, agencies that assist Congress in uh, interacting with the executive branch. Um, they essentially provide the legislative branch with some resources and expertise in crafting legislation and you know, investigating the uh, executive branch. First, we have the Congressional Research Service, which is essentially Congress's um, research arm. Then we have the CBO, or Congressional Budget Office, which essentially assesses the economic implications and cost of, of proposed federal legislation. Then there's the Government Accountability Office, which essentially audits the finances and the administration of all federal agencies and programs. The organization of Congress, or essentially the caucuses. In contrast to the party caucuses that select party leaders, member caucuses are informal groups of senators and or House members that come together to promote shared legislative interests such as the arts, research on a, a whole host of medical issues like arthritis, cancer, things like that, or children defense, immigration tax reforms, women's rights, veterans, and a host of other industries such as corn, lumber, rice, steel, etc. Although they do not have any authority to review legislation or make legislative decisions, caucuses provide an opportunity for members to show their support for specific ideas. There are almost 300 different member caucuses in Congress, many of which have Democratic and Republican members who work together on behalf of their states. Some examples include the Steel Caucuses, Congressional Black Caucus, Congressional Caucus for Women's Issues. Now, let's discuss how a bill becomes a law. Let's talk about a, some key concepts first. A bill is a proposed law sponsored by a member of Congress and submitted to the clerk of the House or the Senate. A bill that proceeds according to a set of procedures that Congress claims to follow becomes law with what they call regular order. Now the House and Senate have one major constitutional obligation to make laws, but a law cannot be made until a member, committee, or a chamber as a whole has an idea for some kind of action. Legislative ideas can come from almost anywhere including lobbying groups that often approach members about special problems, family members who see important problems in their own work, constituents who raise concerns at town hall meetings, and think tanks that supply so much of the research that ends up in congressional testimony. The House and the Senate usually follow the same carefully designed process described in the next sections, but occasionally skip some of the more preliminary steps to save time 
or to address a crisis. The constitutional and electoral structure that checks the two chambers against each other is clearly linked to legislative action. Follow a bill, any bill, through the legislative process, and the odds are that it will die long before the next election. Barely one out of every ten bills even receives a hearing, let alone time on the floor. Legislative time is precious because each sitting Congress only lasts for two sessions, each one lasting one year. If a bill is not passed by the end of the second and last session of Congress, it must work its way and through the entire legislative process again. Every Congress operates for two years, and Congresses are numbered back to the first Congress in 1789. House members introduce bills by simply dropping them in the hopper on the clerk's desk in the front of the House chamber. In turn, senators introduce a bill by handing it to one of the clerks who work at the front of the Senate chamber. House bills are automatically numbered in sequence with an HR at the stop at the start, sorry, while the Senate bills are automatically numbered in sequence with an S followed by a number. In the more informal Senate, members sometimes short circuit these formalities by introducing a bill as an amendment to pending legislation. Presidents have no authority to introduce legislation, although they recommend many proposals that are in turn introduced as bill by other legislatures. Once a bill has been introduced into either chamber, it is read into the daily congressional record as a formal proposal and referred by the House or Senate parliamentarian to a specific committee. The committee often refers the bill to a specific subcommittee. The House and Senate parliamentarians are career employees of Congress and are not chosen by either of the parties. Generally speaking, the committee assignments generally follow the type of legislation that it is. For in other words, if it's if it's a bill on taxation or Social Security, it'll go to the House Ways and Means Committee. If it's a bill about the environment, it'll go to some environmental committee. Most bills go to committee and subcommittees and are never ever seen again. However, at least some are subject to committee or subcommittee hearings and eventual passage. In general, committees pass these proposals down to highly specialized subcommittees where most bills basically die of neglect. For a bill to move forward, hearings are held, the bill is marked up or any changes that are made are written down and a majority of the subcommittee must then support the bill. If the subcommittee votes for a bill, its version is sent back up the chain of approval to the full committee for another round of hearings and another round of review. This step is another likely point at which some bills die. Hearings are only held on the most important legislation. Committees and subcommittees only have so much time to review bills and must choose which ones to consider. Most bills die in subcommittee or committee without either a hearing or markup, but the House does allow its members to force a bill to the floor if a majority signs a petition demanding action. Because most members share a strong sense of, sense of reciprocity or mutual respect towards other committees, the House discharge petitions are rarely successful. The Senate does not allow discharge position, petitions but often allows its members to offer you entirely new bills as amendments to pending legislation. Now, once a committee or subcommittee decides to pass a bill, it marks it up or modifies it to basically conform to its idea of the version of the bill. Now, the term markup refers to the pencil marks that members literally make on the final version of the bill before it's typed up. Each change to the bill, which is, can, can be as little as adding a punctuation mark or deleting a word, must be approved by a majority of the subcommittee or committee during the markup. Bills are rarely marked up unless they have a very high probability of floor action. Once the markup is over and the committee passes the bill, it moves forward towards the floor for consideration. 
we're going to stop there.